and, and welcome. My name is Chris Winslow. I'm director for um, the Ohio Sea Grant Program based at Ohio State University and also director of Ohio State University Stone Laboratory, our island campus up on Lake Erie. And I just want to start off by thanking um, uh, Lord Johnson and, and, and Noah, Rick Stump specifically. Um, this, this forecast wouldn't be possible without the data coming from Heidelberg and, and the great work that's coming out of the NOAA offices um, and, and Rick Stump and all of his work. And also we have a, a great lineup of speakers today that, uh, that we'll get to after we do the loading uh, information. So the loading numbers for uh, 2021. Um, but also what we want to do is, is thank, we have a tremendous amount, as you look at the attendees and, and the RSVP list, we have a tremendous amount of involvement from our state and federal elected officials. Um, too many to name here today, and, and we don't want to miss any names, but there is a, a great representation online uh, from both state and federally elected officials. Um, we've got great NOAA participation on, on the call, on the webinar today. We have uh, folks from the governor's office um, on the call, and also agency leaders and, and state uh, agency scientists on the call. So it's a quite a wide range of folks that are on the call today. So I wanted to thank uh, all of those different groups for their participation today. Um, I'll actually start my video so you can see me. Just to orient everybody on how this is going to run today. So we will be using the chat feature. So if you look in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, that's where you can pose questions. So you can put your questions in that chat feature. It'll go to our panelists. And then at the Q&A portions, I will read those questions to our panelists. Um, oftentimes we get more questions than we can get to. So I'll have to do some uh, arranging of those questions. But we, we look forward to your, your thoughts. Um, we're going to have Laura Johnson from, um, again, Heidelberg University for the National Center for Water Quality um, and Rick Stump go first. So that'll be the loading and then again, the forecast for this year. Um, after those two presentations, we will pause and open up for questions. We won't have questions right after Laura, but we will have questions for both of them um, after Rick finishes. Um, when those questions come in, I will address the ones that are coming from media outlets that are on the webinar today, because I know a lot of those media outlets want to get stories out on this forecast quickly. So we'll get to the media questions first, and then any time we have remaining in that section, I will get to um, questions from the general, general audience. Um, if you have any tech questions, just put those in the chat feature also. Um, so to Jill Gentis and Christina Dierkes from um, Ohio Sea Grant team here, We'll be looking at that uh, uh, chat function, not only for questions, but for, uh, for tech issues. Uh, the webinar will be recorded. You're, you're probably seeing that clock tick on your screen somewhere. So the webinar is recorded and we'll share the recording to all participants shortly after the webinar. Um, if you lose your audio, that sometimes happens. Um, it, I'm hoping it's, it's gonna be a home institution or a home computer or an internet issue for you, but there's the audio video tab drop down. Um, in the upper left-hand corner. So if you see where it says file, edit, share, so on and so forth, the audio video tab should help you uh, address your any um, audio issues that you might have. Um, so again, we have our lead speakers, Laura and Rick, um, some questions, and then we have four guest speakers with us today, and then we'll round out the, um, the morning session here with questions for those four speakers and for Rick and Laura. So if we don't get to any during the designated uh, media question time, we will get to Rick and Laura. Um, Christine, I'm going to turn to you to see if we have all our elected officials on. I do not see Representative Dingle yet, but um, okay. we can start with Representative Captor's video. That should be okay to go. Absolutely. Great. So, Chris, Christina will load that. So, I want to um, thank uh, Congresswoman Captor um, from Ohio's um, 9th District. And so, she uh, was contacted by the forecast and, and, and asked to say a few words. And, of course, we, we, we want to hear from Congresswoman Captor. Um, so I think we're ready for you to load that video and I'll turn my video off. Greetings, I'm Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur, representative for Ohio's 9th Congressional District. Thank you for allowing me to once again be part of this important annual event focused on protecting our drinking water and quality of life here on Lake Erie shores. Unfortunately, the annual harmful algal bloom is now a new way of life for our region. Toxic algae covers our shores and threatens our future. Our region, our fishermen, our boaters, and our water treatment operators rely on this forecast. Today's HAB forecast allows us to track our progress toward reducing the reach of harmful algal blooms and use science to fine tune our early warning technologies. Early projections show this year's bloom will likely be smaller than past blooms, 
but larger than 2020s. While a smaller bloom is good news for our health, the safety of our community and our lake is still at risk. And this risk isn't abstract. HABs impact the daily lives of the 11 million people that depend on our lake for fresh drinking water. We cannot forget the 2014 bloom that left 110 people sick and hundreds of thousands of Ohioans and Michiganders without water. The problem in our region have been exacerbated by climate change, leading to record precipitation, increasingly mild winters, and of course, increasing average temperatures. Additionally, as the warmest and shallowest of the Great Lakes, Lake Erie is uniquely susceptible to HABs and the devastating effects of climate change. These factors have meant toxic blooms are a regular part of life on our lake. Learning how to value and manage water in this region is essential. The Great Lakes generate 1.5 million jobs and $52 billion from recreation and tourism alone. However, we will continue to see challenges in our region. By the year 2050, the global population is projected to be nearly 10 billion people. As our population and food needs rise, we must work with our farmers to increase water, soil, and other farming conservation practices to help diminish the agricultural runoff that is a real catalyst for HABs. Efforts to protect our water and feed our community go hand in hand and require all of us to do our part to protect our precious resources for generations to come. Today's remote participants are on the front lines of this very serious water quality conundrum, with millions of others depending on us to address the effects of HABs on the Great Lakes. There is no easy solution, but we cannot allow ourselves to be discouraged or distracted. By crafting science-based policies, we can solve this puzzle and learn crucial lessons about land and water management that can make for a more prosperous ecolo ecological future as we move into the 21st century. Innovations in agriculture, investments in waste and drinking water systems, and better water management processes are needed to confront the root causes of HABs. I will continue to work to bring the federal resources needed to support research, conservation, restoration, as well as water infrastructure and treatment improvements to our Great Lakes. Thank you to NOAA, Ohio Sea Grant, and our federal and academic research partners for leading the way to promising innovative solutions. Our fresh water future and our ability to sustain life on Earth depend on our efforts to protect and restore Lake Erie, the Great Lakes, and fresh water across our great nation. Thank you for your work. Next, we'll have a, a video that was sent to us by Congressman Bob Latta from Ohio's uh, 5th District. Hi, I'm Congressman Bob Latta, and I want to thank you very much for having me with you today. I'm sorry I'm doing it virtually, but because of our calendar, I couldn't be with you. But first, I want to thank uh, NOAA, the Ohio Sea Grant, and all of its partners, and everything that you're doing out there for har to fight harmful algal blooms. I also want to thank all the researchers and scientists and the students. And I know that for a fact because I started my uh, association with the Ohio State Sea Grant all the way back in 1997 when I was in the Ohio legislature. And I know all the hard work that's been ongoing at the lake to make sure that we fight and defeat the HABs. But I think it's also important that uh, you go back to 2014 when we had the massive algal bloom, especially that affected the uh, metropolitan area around Toledo when 500,000 people did not have drinking water for several days. So it's important in that uh, I work with so many partners on the federal and state level to make sure that we came up with a Drinking Water Protection Act, which we started working on in 2014, that was signed into law in 2015. You know, the EPA has uh, credited for a lot of the work that's been done in our area, but I also want to thank all of the folks out there that have done all of your work that you've done to make sure that we combat HABs. You know, when we think about Lake Erie, it's our crown jewel, especially on our north coast. I think about the billions of dollars that come in just every year to help our communities. It's so essential that we have it because not only do we know about it and utilize it, but the rest of the world knows about what we do at Lake Erie. So I want to thank you very much for all that you do for Lake Erie and combating HABs, and I hope you have a great conference. Thanks very much. That we're going to um, 
Uh, moving to our speakers. And so first off, we've got for us today is Dr. Laura Johnson. Many of you know Laura. Uh, she's the director for National Center for Water Quality Research at Heidelberg University. And as uh, usual, Laura is uh, fantastic at giving us the lows for the current um, forecast year. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Laura. Awesome. All right. Okay, and hopefully you see my presentation right now. Okay, so thanks. We're good? Yep. Good. Thanks. Okay, so thanks everyone for joining me today. As, uh, as Chris mentioned that I will be um, sharing a little bit on our Maumee River nutrient loading, what we've been finding in the river since March. But I wanted to start, I showed this picture on our opening slide here because this is the Maumee River right where we're monitoring it. You can kind of see we monitor over to the right here. So. If you could imagine me sitting in a kayak here taking this picture, that's what I did, not this past summer, but the, the summer before. And so I wanted to start just by showing this map of the Maumee River watershed. This is from one of Margaret Kalsik's most recent uh, papers. And I liked it because you can see lots of interesting things in this watershed. First of all, you know all of the, the red and green, which is corn and soybeans. But then you also see where we're located on um, uh, in Waterville here, and you can tell that we're just upstream of all of the sort of developed area that's in gray upstream of sort of the Toledo metropolitan area. If you went to any one of our stations and we monitor 22 different locations in Ohio and one up in Michigan, the way we operate this is we have um, we have a station by by the river, we're basically pumping water up into that station through a flow through system so we can sample it with an auto sampler three times a day. These samples are stored in a refrigerator, collected on Mondays, and then returned to the laboratory where we analyze them for suspended sediments and all various types of nutrients. However, as in the past, I'm basically just gonna talk about phosphorus today. So once we get in the lab, we analyze for total phosphorus, which is all the phosphorus in this muddy water sample. It's in the water, it's associated with those particles. But then we also analyze for dissolved phosphorus, which is basically what's left in the water after we filter out all of that particulate phosphorus onto a piece of filter paper. Um, as you've probably seen before as well, we also calculate a metric called total bioavailable phosphorus that helps feed into some of these forecasting models. And this is the portion of phosphorus that's available for the algae that'll grow in the lake to be able to use, or the cyanobacteria more appropriately, but it doesn't settle between where we monitor up in Waterville and down at the lake. This ends up being about 8% of this particulate phosphorus. So what I'm gonna show you today is both the dissolved and particulate phosphorus trends since they are both important components of total phosphorus and they sometimes do different things. But then I'm gonna start right now with total bioavailable phosphorus since uh, this is what feeds into the forecast and what you've been seeing with the early season projections. So this is our total bioavailable phosphorus loading starting in March. And the way this works, this is cumulative. So we take every day of load and we sum it together to see how it accumulates between March 1st to the end of July. And you can see that we have samples collected all the way up to uh, June 27th. By June 27th, we'd reached 221 metric tons. There wasn't a whole lot to say about this year. We had a little bit of rain in March, a very, very dry April. You see we didn't accumulate hardly any loads. One big event in May, and then it's sort of been spotty thunderstorms ever since then. There's some potential for more events moving into July. And so you can see we have a bigger range maybe than you're used to seeing. Um, we're also doing our forecast a little bit earlier than normal this year. So if we get to the end of July, you can see we have a little bit of range of what we expect to be the most likely loads. We're expecting them to end somewhere between 248 to 272 metric tons, which is just slightly over our target. If I calculate the target from the dissolved phosphorus and total phosphorus into this total bioavailable phosphorus, it should be 240 metric tons. How does this compare to past years, you ask? Well, funny, I have this graph right here. So what you can see is our maximum 
um, a, your cumulative load of total bioavailable phosphorus. This is basically 2015 and our minimum is in blue. That's basically 2012. We're, basic, we're not nearly as high as we were back in 2015, but we're not quite as low as 2012 either. We're actually kind of similar, a little bit lower than where we were last year. And in black, we have 2020 and lower than we were in 2019, which is the purple here. Okay. And so now I want to go into some of the trends, what we've been seeing over time, how that leads to what we're seeing now. I know that there's been a lot of questions recently about um, where our trending is going in terms of, of loads for all metrics of phosphorus. So I'm starting here with stream flow discharge volume. So this is just water, I'm not talking about what's in the water, just the actual volume of water that came out of the Maumee River um, for this March through July time period. And I have this over the entire period of record. So each bar is a different year. The black line here is our five-year running average. So we can see the trends a little better. And then I have 2021 outlined here in black. And in this figure, I have this projected to July 30th. And what you can see is that it's been a pretty dry year. We're currently at 2.1 cubic kilometers, or if you prefer billions of gallons, it's 555. And by the end of, of, um, of July, we expect it to be about 2.4 to 2.6 cubic kilometers. And I have 2.4 pointed out here. Now, I ended up putting an interesting gray line on here. Usually I use these gray lines as our targets. You can't have a target for flow because we can't really control the weather as far as I understand right now, no matter how much we would really like to. Um, so we, uh, I put this line here as the line at which if we left our concentrations at where we were in 2008, then this is the flow at which we would meet our target loads. So basically we'd meet our loads without doing anything, just it's dry enough, we're gonna get there. And you can see we are really close to where to that line, which is why in the previous figure with total bioavailable phosphorus, we're currently below the target, but end up possibly right over the target. We're, we're kind of straddling that target loads right now. We haven't had flow this low since 2012. Now 2012 was like much lower, so it's not a great comparison. We're more similar to say 2016, 2018, and 2020. 2016 actually is a little bit higher than where we think we'll end up this year. So very dry year. And so what I wanted to do to sort of help everyone out, because I usually pack a lot into these slides is have my big, uh, take home point in red here. So take home point is 2021 flow is low enough to meet our target loads, even at our average concentrations. So if we look at total particulate phosphorus, same setup here with our av running average each year as a bar. 2021 is currently at 643 metric tons, projected to be up to about 693 by the end of July, which is just a little over our target of 674. And so because we're gonna be at our target no matter what, I thought that it'd be fun to throw in a different line this year. And this is what our load would be if we actually met our target concentration. And so that would be 428 metric tons. So you can see that while we might be meeting this load target, we have high enough concentrations that we wouldn't meet that load if we were um, based off of our concentrations, which I'll show in a minute. So our TPP loads are lower than recent years, right? Look at, at uh, 2020, 2019, 2018, about the same as 2016. Moving forward, we have dissolved reactive phosphorus, and this is where we see that you know, higher levels early in the 80s that jumped down to the 90s and then basically had a steady increase. I would say since the mid-2000s, we've sort of leveled off up here. Um, we're currently at 171 metric tons, projected to get up to 194. Note our target is 186 metric tons. So we're expected to end up a little bit over where our target would be. Again, I calculated what our load would be if we met that target concentration of 0.05, and that would be 119 metric tons. And so you can see we're definitely over that. Um, so we're meeting the target mostly just because it's a dry year. Um, 2021 is, yeah, an outline of black here. So our take home point here is that DRP loads are pretty similar to 2018 and 2020, a little bit lower, not nearly as low as they were in 2016. 
So let's look at concentrations. And before I jump into it, I just want to remind you all that these flow weight and mean concentrations up here are essentially taking that load I just showed you and dividing it by stream flow. So when we have these big changes from one year to the next, we're correcting for that stream flow. And what we see is for total particulate phosphorus, this downward trend that happened through the 2000s, a little bit of oscillation here. Don't worry so much about this increase because that's being mostly driven by 2020 where we had that big increase in particulate phosphorus concentrations. We're currently at 0.308, which is almost exactly the average since 2008 and definitely above our target line of 0.18 here. Dissolve reactive phosphorus, that's that very familiar U-shaped plot where we were down at the target or below through the 90s. Saw the increase when we've leveled off here. We're currently at um, 0.082, which is, again, almost exactly our average since 2008 of 0.08, and definitely above our target of 0.5. So take home point, concentrations are average this year. We have had low flow, but we're at a normal concentration as we've seen since uh, you know, since 2008. There have been some questions. It looks like maybe we're starting to see a downward trend here in our flow weight and mean concentrations. What do we take from this? Is this really real? And I would want to urge a little bit of caution in trying to see too much into this trend at the end of the plot for a number of reasons. First of all, 2018 and 2020, I put them in black here. You can see that both of them, those flows were running below average and concentrations are affected at low flow that starts to drop off a little bit. And then the other anomaly in here is 2019 where concentrations were way lower than expected because we had unplanted agricultural fields. So our DRP trend recently is due to recent low flow years and 2019. And we know that we're back up to normal where we were in past years here. So I'm expecting once we start adding that in, we're gonna just see it sort of stay flat here, unfortunately. And so that's why really I've been pushing that if we wanna look for trends in our data that we need to maybe take other approaches. And the approach I've been showing for the past few years is comparing our loads versus flow, where then we can look at the line of our past year, so 2002 to 2018, and see are we on this line, are we above it, or are we below it? And in this figure, we have our targets, we have our two prediction intervals, I've got all of our forms of phosphorus here, and then what I've done is I'm showing the last three years in varying shades of red. So first I wanna focus on 2021, and so for 2021, the question is, are there loads where we would expect based off of past data and for the amount of flow that we have? You can see we would expect to be right on that line. We're really close to it. We're within this prediction interval for particulate phosphorus, dissolved reactive phosphorus, and total bioavailable phosphorus. So the answer to this question is a resounding yes. I do want to pop out that the current loads are, are, these are current loads as of July 27th, not projected to the end of the season, which is why they're all slightly below this target. You can see in this figure then the other interesting things that total particulate phosphorus load in 2020 was a bit higher than expected. That is something that we feel is because of following that 2019 fallow ground, there was a bit more tillage. You can see the 2019 and dissolved reactive phosphorus and total bioavailable phosphorus being lower than expected. However, maybe you want to just play with all this data yourself and you don't think that I've done a, a sufficient job at showing you these trends and data. You want to look at a different period of time or a different um, analyte altogether. Well, lucky for you, we are just rolling out a new data portal. This was built just recently. And so you can see if you went to this website here, you could click on data portal. You'll see all the locations where we're monitoring. You can select a station over, over here on this side menu, or you can just click on the red dot. When you do that, you'll pop up with a, um, essentially with a, a series of different things you can select to look at. So this, I chose the mommy, and you can see I've selected total phosphorus as well as flow. So the total phosphorus is in blue and the flow is in black. And you can see how when, the, when it rains, you see the concentrations increase and they come down. Um, this starting, of course, March 1st of 2021, because that's the period of time we're talking about. So go check that out. If you're having some troubles, there is a user guide on our website under our monitoring menu. I also have soluble reactive phosphorus because 
soluble reactive, dissolved reactive, same thing. Can't help but show a little bit of that. And we've had some interesting peaks that have happened this year for sure. So with that, um, my main conclusions are here, right? Discharge was low this year. It's been the lowest since 2012. That's not a fair comparison. It's really similar to 2016. Um, both DRP and total phosphorus, particulate phosphorus loads will be near their target load this year because of this low flow, but the concentrations are still well above the targets. Recent downward trends and either loads or flow for DRP are a combination of unintentional actions that happened in 2019. I'm guessing that people are still going to want to plant and apply some fertilizer and low flow in 2018 and 2020. But I want to point out something, you know, so we think of, of phosphorus as having this legacy or this lag time where we start to make changes and it takes potentially a very long time to see the reductions that we want to see. But I just want to point out that what we learned in 2019 is that these efforts where we apply fertilizer either at the right time, place, or rate, it appears that they could reduce DRP loads far more quickly than we were expecting and have a bigger impact than we than we thought. And so that's our little bit of hope to keep us moving forward with these right practices. Um, this is my contact info and online, these links will be there, but the this is the link for the data portal and our website. Laura, thank you very much for that. We have a couple questions that came in already, but let's get to Rick's forecast and then we'll field all of those questions. So um, we're gonna go to Rick now. Rick, I've got your slides. Can we do an audio check, please? Okay. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. It's all yours, sir. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Chris. And thank you, Laura, for that uh, the great description of the uh, the loads. So that covers a, a huge amount of, of the effort we have here. So our forecast for Lake Erie um, involves a, a combination of efforts. Of course, um, from the backdrop, we've been using our satellite data to um, evaluate the blooms each year. We need Laura's data, of course, uh, the Heidelberg data for the actual loads for the MAMI. And then the models that we apply to, to the blooms come from uh, several sources, not only our sources, but also models from uh, Carnegie Institutes in Stanford and University of Michigan as well. And the, um, the flows going up through the end of the month come out of our Ohio River Forecast Center. So uh, thanks to all the collaborators that help uh, assemble the various pieces of this. Um, just to do a recap of looking with last year, um, uh, 2020, we had a relatively small bloom. I will note that all the models except for one tended to overestimate. So our forecast last year was relatively high. Um, Laura covered the loads, but a key key thing that changed last year was is as a result of that, several of the models were recalibrated um, in order to make those corrections. That's an important part of, of the, the exercise of uh, doing a forecast and evaluating them is uh, to make sure that our, our models and forecasts are actually can stay up to date and current and accurate. Um, I'll also just note here on the severity, you can see in the last few years, we've had variability where we generally had high blooms. You note 2020 was small, 2019, 17, and 15 were all large, large blooms, 16, 18, and 20 were relatively small, um, <clears throat> oscillating between those. Okay, a uh, different way to look at the blooms. This is the peak of each bloom over the last 20 years, and uh, you can see that. Uh, um, the peaks were smaller at the beginning of the uh, of this century, and the last few years they were um, uh, quite variable. I'm just drawing you attention to some characteristics here. If we look at the worst blooms, um, which are 2011, 2015, 13, and 17, those are the four four worst blooms we've seen. Um, how much variability there is? Uh, 2015 was extensive all around um, the western basin and well out past there. And uh, and also going down to the Canadian shoreline, of course, 2011 reached Cleveland. But you had circumstances like in 2013, it was right up against the Ohio shoreline. And then in 2017, I'm sure people in Toledo recall that there was scum in the Maumee River in September, and that actually went straight across to Leamington on the Ontario side. So each one of these varies between years, depending on the wind conditions. I just note, just circle the, the relatively mild recent blooms, 16, 18, and 20. There have been other mild ones. 
and those have shown some variability, um, uh, perhaps short term with a slightly intense area, like in uh, 2016, it was not a very strong bloom, but for a very short time, there was a, a period of intense bloom on this coast, but that did that only lasted for a week or two, and then it dissipated quickly. So there's a lot of variation um, within the same type of year, and that has to do with wind conditions, which unfortunately we can't forecast this far in advance which direction the wind's going to blow. Uh, the uh, Lake Erie Bulletin, as we know it, um, we're some changes in it. Uh, the site, there is now a new site. We had sent out an, a notice just last week on this, um, a change in the look. This is the landing page, um, uh, or copy of the landing page here. Um, we have the satellite imagery as the observed position, uh, the forecast bloom position, including uh, model currents and also uh, wind and, and temperature in the uh, western basin. And then the vertical mixing model is useful for saying, are we likely to see the bloom at the surface, meaning there might be scum, or uh, is it possible, more likely it'll be mixed with the water column, which is perhaps more important for the water intake managers. So we have three components. We also have links to additional data um, on the page. Um, our, our Great Lakes Laboratory collects uh, weekly samples you can, and has monitoring systems. Also, the Great Lakes Observing System also has uh, information as well, and all those links can be tapped to the web page. <clears throat> um, just as a shorter link, if you're trying to write it down, if you do code.usa.gov and xgcd, that'll get you right to the page as well. Um, also, if you're interested in, in a hard copy bulletin, there is a link right at the top to get the bulletin. Whoops, and I, sorry, and if, if anyone is not subscribing to get notifications, um, you can do that here. Notifications are not a bulletin email, but they let you know of any, any changes, uh, significant changes of the bloom. So keeps you aware of what's going on, of, of what's going on with the system. Okay, <clears throat> just an example of imagery. This is, happens to be yesterday um, uh, after some rather cloudy weather, um, rainy weather as, as you all know, and up in the area it cleared up. And um, there's right now pretty clear conditions. We cannot yet detect a bloom in Lake Erie. There's a hint of cyanobacteria in Sandusky Bay, but um, not very much of that at this time. And in the rest of the lake for the other areas, we do not yet see, also don't see any, any evidence of a bloom from satellite as well. Cyanobacteria is just at trace levels from the field samples. Okay. Um, we use an ensemble of models. Um, we have, a, I, I won't go into the details here, um, but there's um, empirical, statistical uh, models, uh, Bayesian, um, three different, they're all constructed in different ways, the, the various models we have here, and they're based on the phosphorus loads um, such that Laura described before. Just to recap from Laura's data, um, the current load is, uh, uh, so far, it's 220 uh, metric tons of total bioavailable phosphorus, and that's the phosphorus that's key for the bloom. Bioavailable phosphorus is what cyanobacteria will take up and use. And by the end of June, we may be up to 270 uh, metric tons um, with the, what we expect with the current conditions. Okay, so um, based on that, we're composing those models. Uh, this is what we expect for this year. Um, our forecast is a three um, of a severity, which puts us about the same as last year, um, very similar to 2016 and 18, and but a potential range. It could be as small as two, although we'd say that's not the most likely, but it could also go up to 4.5. And this is a combination of some of the uncertainty in the rainfall and also the models have different assumptions into them, and so they cover a slightly different range. But what we're looking at fundamentally is a bloom similar to last year. What I'd like to note is for the first time in a decade, we're actually looking at two consecutive years uh, with a relatively mild bloom, 2020 and this year. We'd have to go back to 2007 to actually have seen something similar given the wet weather. And this overall reflects the lower than average spring runoff that we have, um, the, all the, the, the information Laura just captured. Um, just kind of touching this, though, um, an important consideration that if, you know, if we have two mild blooms, 
you know, it's easy to say that, well, things are looking good and to, to ease up. Well, um, a key, key thing is we have been in a wet period and we may be going in, perhaps we're going into a dry period. And this graph shows the discharge from the Maumee River going back to 1939. You can see there have been wet periods uh, about every 40 years, exceptionally wet, and then also periods of dry weather. And so I should caution that um, if we are end out in a drier period, um, we may go through a round of um, smaller blooms, but we go back into a wet period and we could have concern there. Um, I'll also note that each one of these wet periods has gotten a little larger and that is consistent with the, the climate changes, which have shown um, a, a slow increase in rainfall, particularly spring rainfall in this area. So um, it's a little hard to presume what may happen when we're, if, if we um, continue in a wet period, but I, it's, we need to keep in mind that if we go, if we re stay in the wet period we're in now, or we return to it, that we will be um, back at blooms if we do not get those uh, concentrations down relative to the load. So it's very important to reduce the concentrations. And per particularly, you know, anytime we have drier weather, there's an opportunity. Um, <clears throat> the phosphorus reduction, um, Laura touched on, if we had a 40% reduction, we've, we've taken our models and applied how large the bloom might be each of these years if we actually had implemented the 40% reduction back in 2002. And so that threshold would mean that most years we would see um, a very uh, negligible bloom, one below the threshold. And this year, if we were at that 40% reduction, the forecast would be for pretty much a negligible bloom. We would see almost nothing this year um, if we actually had already met the target. So that's, that's something to keep in mind that we would have um, clear, cleaner lake overall if we were able to reduce that target as well. Um, so to reduce this, um, the overall forecast, uh, we expect a severity of three, uh, uh, similar to last year, uh, 2021, uh, possible range of two, two to um, 4.5. This will be um, second consecutive mild year um, uh, since 2007. Um, I can't emphasize enough that most of the lake will be fine most of the time, even though there will be some bloom in the lake, um, but it does not cover all the lake and it's, it also has to grow and the winds move it around. Again, second consecutive year is smaller bloom. And this is resulting from a drier spring. Not, this is from low flow, not a reduction in the actual concentration of nutrients going into the, into the water. Um, when there is um, areas that will have high concentrations, which we can identify from the satellite, there is a risk of, of scums forming during calm days. And it's important to um, check for that. Can't emphasize enough that um, toxins, there's always some toxin in the bloom and scums are what concentrates it's the most. And so it's important not to go swimming in that and also keep, keep, um, keep your dogs out of the water also. Um, that's, it's quite dangerous for dogs because they're swimming right at mouth level and they don't need to ingest this stuff. Um, our, our bulletin has the bloom location and intensity and forecast is where it's likely to be. So you can continue to monitor that. And again, the bloom impact on the Western Basin varies with winds. With a milder bloom this year, if we're doing well, we'll tend to have southwest winds, which will tend to keep it out and disperse more in the middle of the basin. Um, uh, worst case is going to be the calm wind conditions overall. So that wraps up our forecast and uh, thank you very much. Rick, thanks for that. Um, I'm gonna open up my video and audio here. So we do have a couple questions that came in from our um, media attendees. So the first one I'll read for you. And of course, Laura, if you wanna open up your audio, if, if this is something you can field. I'm uh, from Kathy Kowalski. She's a freelance for uh, Energy News Network, Science News for the Students and other publications. Um, are the higher lake levels we had for the last two years still having any effect on the expected algal bloom size? Uh, the higher lake levels have not shown um, a obvious impact on the bloom. Uh, it is slightly possible that the, the flow through the Detroit River 
may be slightly reducing, may have slightly reduced the size last year. Um, but so the higher lake level overall causes a greater flow in the Detroit River coming through the lake. So that may have moved a little more water through because last year was that may partially explain part of the underestimate as well. But otherwise, there's no other particular impact of the high lake level. It's not enough to dilute the water coming in. If you're asking that question, that's it's more of pushing water through the lake is the bigger factor. Thank you, Rick. Coming at it from another one, and I believe this has already been hit here, but uh, it's Danny Eldridge um, of HANA News. Um, Laura, when you mentioned target loads, what target is, is is this talking about? Is this the one Ohio agreed with other states in Canadian Providence or something else? Just to clarify, that is the Annex 4 target, correct? Yeah, I'm using the Annex 4 targets, although technically they're somewhat redundant, although I think that that agreement occurred actually before the Annex 4 loads were officially out, in fact. And should say that's the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. Yes. Just, just so Correct. people know, Annex yeah. 4, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. I, you know, I had for a whole those, slide where I went over. I had a whole slide where I went over all of those loads, but it, it was too much time. <laughs> and I apologize using the term Annex. That is the uh, Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement has multiple annexes that address you know, issues that are in the Great Lakes and the one that addresses nutrients and its harmful algal blooms is called Annex 4. I apologize for that. Get caught in my, my terminology. Um, so. Christy Frank, um, freelancer, how is the target load calculated? What, why, so that's question one, why the decrease in phosphorus prior to the 1990s and then consistent increase? So question one is how the target load was calculated? Yep. Well, so that was done through a series of different models. Actually, Rick was part of it and he could probably speak to that a little bit more than me. Um, so maybe Rick, I'll let you have the floor for that one. Okay, the, we, had, we had run a series of models of the various concentrations, and these were models similar to what we're using here in order to say how large the bloom would be for different loads. And with those combination of models, we were able to come up with a, a set of conditions that if we had this amount of load going in, this concentration, we would expect these blooms of this size. And from there, we identified what, what was generally recognized as a tolerable size, acceptable size of a bloom. That's a little strong to say acceptable, but that was where we were. And so the idea was to hit that load that would reach that acceptable bloom size and that that hits the target. So then I think, Laura, then you can answer the other part. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, the, the second part was asking about why do we see an increase, especially in the dissolved phosphorus, since the 90s through to more recent, you know, through to the 2000s. And, you know, that's one of the questions I get a lot and it's very difficult to answer because everything changed in, in agriculture in the mid 90s. Um, we've basically uh, you know, been able to attribute these changes to changes in, in agricultural practices, but a lot of these things include, you know, conversion into um, more conservation tillage, which meant larger, pieces of equipment, which leads to more soil compaction. It also means to changes in how fertilizer is uh, mixed into, into the soil and the development of um, what we call phosphorus stratification in the soil. The other thing that happened is, um, you know, tile drain intensity increased in the 2000s as well, um, just so that uh, you could drain the fields a little bit more quickly because that leads to a noticeable benefit for crop yields. I think there's other things that changed as well, and I know I'm missing them. There's a paper that lists about 100 of them, but I would say the most recent sort of um, hypotheses that it seemed to be converging a little bit is that the reason we see the increases and in these losses in dissolved phosphorus are a combination of, you know, accumulation of phosphorus on the surface of the soil leading to an accumulation of phosphorus combined with um, tile drains, and what ends up happening is that they develop these, what we call macropores, it's like highways between the surface and the tile drain, that subsurface flow that helps push dissolved phosphorus into that drain, and that's why it leaks out. So it's, it's a unique set of circumstances that is uh, difficult to assess. You can ask Kevin King all about that. 
Laura, the only thing I would add to that, we, we do know that we've seen climatic changes. I mean, Rick has also shown that there are wet and dry periods, and overall in the Great Lakes, it's supposed to be a wetter winters and um, wet springs with dry summers. Um, so there are some climatic changes that are in there. We still have changes in things like zebra and quagga mussels that are in the lake and invasive species. Um, so there are a lot of different biological processes happening in the rivers and in the lake that are tied with this change from 90s into 2000. So, Laura's correct, there's a lot of changes in agricultural practices, but there's also some larger contextual things uh, that are going on. Got another question in here that I'm going to read from Kathy. She's referencing, though, the, the, in the 2019, the big bloom in the central and eastern Lake Erie that had some impact on swimming beaches and the like. Um, and she wondered if there was any way to similarly forecast these events, number one, and also, is this a different type of cyanobacteria that are driving these blooms? So number one, type of bloom, and is there an ability to forecast? Yeah, the the blooms typically in the central basin are different cyanobacteria, um, something called Dilichospermum, and uh, it's most common in for a couple of weeks in July. Um, the eastern lake, um, Presque Isle Bay, gets some blooms, but it's often Microcystis. That's a local bloom, also, and each one of those are, and then you can get. Patchy blooms near some of the river mouths going up the Ohio coast. Uh, uh, right now, um, we have a poor understanding of the central basin bloom. Um, it's a difficult place data. And so we can't, right now, we don't have a means to say when there's going to be a bloom um, in the central basin that's substantial. These, these small ones. We're, we're now starting to get to a point of having data to do a better job of observing those blooms. Um, uh, my group is working with some higher resolution satellite data that might allow us to pick those up better. And our Great Lakes Lab has been experimenting with some aircraft uh, methods that we could fly the coast. And as we start collecting more data on those, we'll be able to do a much better job of um, identifying them. Um, just as well, um, as monitoring systems improve or sensors, having more of those in, we'll be able to capture that. I'd like to say we have a way to forecast them, but we don't We don't at this time. Rick, thank you for that. Just a comment to interject here too. Uh, and Laura pointed out in the beginning, this is not just a phosphorus concern for us, right? So we need to be thinking about nitrogen. So I'm channeling my inner Tom Bridgman from the University of Toledo and, and Tim Davis with Bowling Green State University and Sylvia Newell down in Wright State. Justin, we'll talk about that a little. So. When we talk about these blooms, a lot of this is the phosphorus and DRP loading, but we need to have nitrogen still on our on our radar for these. Um, Laura, I see you took your camera on if you want to build on that, but then I have another immediate question or two. I just wanted to point out that, yes, we do monitor nitrogen uh, multiple forms. And so if you're interested in those data or those results, um, I'm always happy to answer questions about that too. It's high, yes. Yeah. Um, coming back to Danny from Hannah News, uh, could you talk about what effect if uh, any of the H2O Ohio, H2O Ohio has had on these blooms being smaller? Um, is the state on the right track with these policies? So, Laura, I'll let you take a crack at that, and then I have some thoughts also. Yeah, so I think it's a little too soon uh, to see the effects of H2O Ohio yet, um, and I'm sure that there's someone on here that can write in the chat and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but my impression is that a lot of those H2 Ohio, at least the agricultural practices, um, basically have been in contract and were just being implemented, you know, starting this fall and into the spring. So it's a little early to say about that. Um, I know that you'll hear a lot from Lauren on the H2 Ohio wetlands and those projects, um, the first batch of them are just newly constructed starting really this spring. So they, we still need a little bit more time for all of these things to, to sort of pick up speed. Um, so I would say we can't tell yet, but I am very hopeful, especially with the agricultural H2 Ohio practices, because there's a big focus on nutrient management. And what I mentioned at the end of my talk was that really that nutrient management, I think, is going to be really key, especially if we can start thinking about where we're applying our phosphorus. We want to replicate what happened in 2019, but not lead to a point where we're just not applying fertilizer. So how do we replicate that and still apply our fertilizer to me? getting off the surface is going to be really important. So um, so I'm hopeful with h Ohio. I think that once we finally get all of that going, we're going to see some effects. 
And so just to build up on that, not only is it, you know, early as far as deployment, um, getting those practices in the ground, takes a lot of staffing from ag to, to make those relationships and those possible, but also we're going to remember there's a lag effect in a lot of these things. So even if the deployment of that is in the field, for those things to take a hold and, and do what they're intended to do, there is a, a lag period there. And then also know that we're faced with Mother Nature showing wet and dry years at us. And so it's tough to sign. Sometimes we're getting better at that, but to tease those apart. Was the bloom totally because of a, a wet, wet year or was it for some other reason? Um, I would also say, and, and Laura references pointing to 2019, um, if, if we do the four R practices, right rate, right time, right source, right place, 2019 showed us that if, if you know those those practices are happening, you can see a, a pretty quick reduction in the total phosphorus and dissolved reactive phosphorus making the system. So I think the things that H2 Ohio is funding to put into the field are the right things to be doing. So it's exciting to see what will be unfolding over the next couple of years. Um, I'll just uh, add a, one comment that while we had a bad bloom in 2019, if we had had the normal, the average concentration, given the flow we had in 2019, it might have been the worst bloom Lake Erie had seen. So, so there's, we can have an immediate impact if we can get these things into play. We don't have to wait 10 years to get, to get the blooms down. And that's what that's shown. When we've had a year when it was 40% of the load because of a dry year, we were at the target that Annex 4 has come back to. So when Rick says the model picked a 40% reduction based on 2008, when we've seen it in reality in the lake, the lake has shown us what we hoped to see, which is basically a negligible bloom. So those are good and promising things. Um, Tom Henry writes a question from the Toledo Blade. Found that July rain had more impact um, than expected a few years ago. This is what he's recalling. Is it possible that an extreme wet July could push us past the 4.5 on the severity index? Uh, so, well, it's possible it could. So far, wet Julys have tended to follow wet Junes and late spring. And they, they do feed on each other. So um, if you already have a more uh, saturated ground, then you end out with a, a bigger influence of the July, um, the July rains. Uh, for this year, I would, well, first, we don't expect to see, the weather systems aren't favorable for it, but I would say because we've been relatively dry, um, I wouldn't expect a big effect. Let's hope we don't ever act, nature doesn't actually throw that at us from a, Full blown experiment. But July loads do matter, but typically the wet Julys have followed wet Junes pretty consistently. Good. Um, I've got another one here. This one's from um, Tom Jackson. It's, the question is Is a forecast of three on a scale of 10, and what was the size of our biggest bloom? And so I know 2011 makes, or 2015 makes that a weird one, Rick, but you want to talk about that? Yeah. Too? Okay. We, we set up the scale. Um, and this was after uh, 2011, and so we needed a, a logical stop. And as 2011 was big, we figured there couldn't possibly be another bloom that size. So we set the scale based on 2011 as being a 10. 2015 was bigger. So it ended out being 10.5 on a scale of one to 10, I guess you could put it. But um, te technically the scale can go up higher, um, but it's, um, uh, I, we shouldn't expect to see that again. Rick, thanks for that. That's all the questions that I have coming in from um, media folks in front of me. We can, if we get some that trickle in later, we can ask them at the next round of Q&A. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jim, if you can get your uh, video started to make sure we have a connection there. So the next speaker for us today will be uh, Dr. Jim Hood. He's an assistant professor for the Department of Evolution, Ecology and Organismal Biology at Ohio State University. He will be one of the next four speakers that we have um, after these four speakers are done, we'll open it up for Q&A again. That Q&A can be for these four speakers, but also uh, we hope you ask any follow-up questions you might have for Laura and Rick. They will be sticking around with us. And I, I am seeing some more questions already trickling in. I will mention that folks did submit some questions via um, the, the registration for this event. So if we don't get all the questions um, or we don't get enough questions during the Q&A, I will try and read some of those. Unfortunately, we got so many questions via the registration that we won't be able to get to all of them, but we'll do our best um, to consolidate some of those. So Jim, let's do, I see your screen is perfect. Can we get an audio check? Yep, can you hear me? We got you, it's all yours, sir. All right, great, thanks, Chris. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity 
to talk to you. And today I'm gonna to talk about the role of rivers in shaping phosphorus exports to Lake Erie. So as Dr. Johnson and Dr. Stumpf have already told us, harmful algal blooms in Lake Erie are driven by March to July phosphorus loads from the Maumee watershed. And as they've emphasized, we know that uh, dissolved reactive phosphorus and bioavailable phosphorus loads are particularly important in fueling harmful algal blooms. Phosphorus management requires understanding the sources of that phosphorus. And our current model for determining those sources assumes that phosphorus moves from the landscape, enters the ditches and streams, and moves through ditches, streams, and rivers downstream and is exported to Lake Erie. Currently, we assume that particulate and dissolved phosphorus that's moving through the river systems just moves downstream like water through a pipe. So these river systems are neither a source for phosphorus or a sink for phosphorus. This is a really great simplifying assumption for management and for modeling, but what I'd like to address here is whether or not that's a, that assumption is correct. And to sort of get a little bit ahead of myself, uh, my argument is that it probably isn't. And to think about this, it's useful to split systems into two periods. Periods, river systems, periods with low to moderate flow, which represent about 15% of March to July dissolved reactive phosphorus exports, the most bioavailable, and periods with high flow, which represent about 85% of March to July dissolved reactive phosphorus exports. And during low and moderate flow, we know in general from science that streams and river systems can be phosphorus sources or sinks, but we, we know relatively little about those processes and the balance of source and sink behavior in the Maumee watershed. Similar to that, under high flow conditions, we know that stream and river systems can add sediment to rivers through erosion and can remove sediment phosphorus via deposition on the floodplains. However, it's generally assumed by scientists that dissolved phosphorus is piped downstream passively. I'm gonna talk about some work later that, that challenges that assumption, but first I'd like to ask, why, is, why does this matter? Why do we care what's going on in the river? And the, and the answer to that is it's because it has strong management implications for our ability to manage phosphorus. If phosphorus is being piped down to the river, so the size of that arrow is cha being changed by the river systems, we don't really need to worry about these systems from the standpoint of managing phosphorus. However, if the river systems are a phosphorus source, so the amount of phosphorus is increasing, Streams and rivers are contributing phosphorus to exports, and so they're contri also contributing to cyanobacteria blooms, and they're part of the problem that likely requires management or restoration. In contrast, if these river systems are a phosphorus sink, so they're actually decreasing phosphorus as it moves downstream, they're helping mitigate cyanobacteria blooms. And in that case, we need to sort of understand those processes and work to sustain them into the future. So our overarching questions here are, do streams and rivers act like pipes for phosphorus or are they phosphorus sources and sinks? If it's the latter case, where and when are they phosphorus sources and sinks in space or in time and through which processes or mechanisms? And should we manage these systems differently once we have this information? And to get at this in this short talk, I'm gonna focus on these high flow periods, which are um, dominate dissolve reactive phosphorus export to Lake Erie. And so this work is the work of Whitney King, who was a master's student in my uh, lab group here at Ohio State. And she was, work she was interested in testing this assumption that um, during high flow events, during storm events, river systems are just passively piping dissolve reactive phosphorus downstream. So she selected these six sites shown here with the uh, red dots. And between January and June of 2019, she chased storm events up there. So every time there's a storm event, she went up and sampled phosphorus cycling in the river. She managed to capture 13 storm events, uh, which resulted in 78 total measurements, 75% of which result, uh, met our criteria for high flow. So what did Whitney find? In, in general, she found that during high flow events, sediment being transported downstream was a phosphorus sink. And so this is this basically explains what's happening. It, during these high flow events, you can think of phosphorus in these rivers in two compartments. In one compartment, phosphorus is bound to the sediment. That's, that phosphorus is 
less than 20% bioavailable. And then in the other compartment, phosphorus is dissolved in the water column and it's 100% bioavailable. And what Whitney found was that these sediments were binding phosphorus to the sediment. And therefore, they were not reducing the total amount of phosphorus exports, but they were definitely reducing dissolved phosphorus exports and the bioavailability of phosphorus exports. And so this plot shows uh, the rate of phosphorus binding from the sediments on the y-axis versus the sediment concentration on the x-axis. Each color is data from a different stream. And you can see that the phosphorus binding rate increases with the amount of sediments in the stream. So more sediments, more phosphorus binding. But the big question here is how much that matters to phosphorus exports to Lake Erie and algal blooms there. To get at that, we took phosphorus binding rate measurements from Whitney's data, combined them with uh, Maumee River suspended sediment concentration data and dissolved reactive phosphorus data from Heidelberg, some of which Laura's already shown you. And we used that to estimate dissolved phosphorus binding by all sediments leaving the watershed. And to, to illustrate this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you here this is March to June dissolved phosphorus loads during high flow events. It's very similar to what Dr. Johnson has already shown you from 1975 to 2019. And what I'm gonna do is, is estimate what these loads would be in the absence of phosphorus binding. So if we removed all the sediments from the streams or if we were somehow able to shut off that process. And what we see here is that without phosphorus binding, dissolved reactive phosphorus loads to Lake Erie would be much higher. And the red ribbon illustrates how much higher. Sediment, over this period, sediment binds between 20 and 300% of dissolved phosphorus exports to Lake Erie. And if we focus on this period between 2003 and 2019, when we've seen the reemergence of these cyanobacteria blooms, we see that sediment reduces on average dissolved phosphorus exports by about 24%. So this results these results indicate that the Maumee River system is likely a phosphorus sink and that the system is actually uh, constraining cyanobacteria blooms in the lake likely, but it's very difficult to estimate how much of an effect that's having. So to summarize here, uh, during high flow periods, Whitney's work is showing us that during spring and early summer, the Maumee River system is likely a dissolved phosphorus sink. Phosphorus binding rates are tightly correlated with the amount of sediment during, in transport during these storm events. But I would emphasize that there's a lot that we don't know about the spatial variability in uh, the, whether these systems are sources or sinks for phosphorus. And there's a lot of assumptions that need additional validation. During low flow periods, data that I haven't shown you from our group and collaborators um, show that some stream and rivers are phosphorus sinks while well, others are phosphorus sources. There's a high degree of spatial variability in these processes, but P sources and sink are potentially at least important at the stream scale, but we have a really poor understanding of how those different stream reaches across the basin sum up to influence total exports to the lake. Uh, but taken together, this indicates that rivers are not pipes, they're sources and sinks, and we need a better understanding of those processes. So uh, ongoing uh, harmful algal bloom research initiative project uh, being, that we're conducting with my co-PI shown here has two main objectives. The first is to quantify spatial patterns in stream phosphorus cycling during low and high flows and estimate the impact on phosphorus delivery to Lake Erie. And then we're gonna incorporate that information into watershed models and see how that influences the results. Happy to talk more about that later. Uh, so finally, I'd like to conclude by just raising some management considerations. The first is that this work reveals some trade-offs in watershed scale phosphorus management. We need to consider what happens if sediment erosion is reduced and how that will influence river phosphorus exports and start thinking about what the right balance is between the negative effects of sediment erosion on aquatic health and soil health and the positive effects of sediment erosion potentially on uh, dissolve phosphorus loads. <coughs> Second, uh, now that we know that rivers are phosphorus sources and sinks, how do we manage these systems to increase phosphorus retention? 
We know we have tools such as stream restoration, ditch maintenance, and two-stage ditches, but these, these approaches are likely no replacement for managing upland inputs of phosphorus, sediment, and water. And so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions later during the Q&A session. Thank you. Jim, thank you for that. And just to stress the first bullet there, the, there are huge trade-offs. What we're finding in this whole situation is that, um, you know, one solution um, in one place has a negative impact in the other. And so, you know, the, the sediments do seem like they can hold on to some of that phosphorus, but those sediments are also causing biological issues in those streams and, and in downstream. And that sediment is the stuff we want on our producer's fields because that's a that's healthy soil to be growing crops in. So this is just introducing some very, very early work that uh, we're excited to see, but lots more work to be done in this space. So Jim, thank you for that. And, and we'll go to the next speaker and then I'll bring on some questions for you here towards the end. Thank you, Chris. Yep, that, great. Excellent. Next, we're going to bring on Justin Chaffin, who's a research coordinator for Ohio State University Stone Lab and, and Ohio Sea Grant. So we'll see if you can get your video up, uh, Justin, and we'll see if we can check the. I'm seeing your whole PowerPoint. Great. If now it's the slide. Why don't we do an audio check real quick? Hello, can you hear me? I got you, Justin. It's all you, sir. Go for it. All right. Hi, right, thanks, Chris, uh, and, and and thanks for the invite. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about microcystins, which are the the toxins the cyanobacteria create in Lake Erie. Uh, but today, I'm going to talk about a small part of a NOAA EcoHab funded project uh, that looks at microcystin forecasting. Um, uh, more information on that project I'm going to present at the September 8th uh, Understanding Algal Blooms, uh, the State of the Science meeting. And we have a manuscript that was just accepted by the Journal of Harmful Algae that's going to uh, go more into in depth what I'm going to share today. So more information uh, you can find out uh, later on. <clears throat> but we saw from Dr. Stumpf that uh, harmful algal bloom biomass can be monitored from from satellites at a large spatial scale with high resolution. Uh, but a question we have: Can we make similar maps for microcystins? Uh, however, we know that microcystins, um, microcystin concentrations cannot be predicted from cyanobacterial biomass. Uh, so you can't just simply judge if it's toxic or not based on how green. And uh, this graph shows cyanobacteria biomass on the X and microcystins on the Y. And you see there's no relationship between the two. And it's even more evident when you look at where most of the data falls and really there's no relationship between biomass and toxins. So you, you can't make these maps assuming uh, that they're proportional. So in order to make uh, these maps, we need a lot of microcystin data, a lot of samples collected. In 2018 and 2019, uh, we conducted a one day intensive survey of microcystins in the Western Basin. Um, you see all the collaborators uh, shown on this map here, um, and each group sampled a different region of the lake. Each red dot is a sample location, and the color map behind it is the satellite data of harmful algal bloom biomass for that day. All samples were collected with the same method, and all samples were analyzed in one lab, so we didn't have to worry about lab to lab differences. Uh, so with this data set, we can estimate the spatial distribution of microcystins uh, with high confidence. And this also allows us to compare microcystins with environmental data such as nutrients, uh, such as phosphorus and nitrogen concentrations, uh, uh, temperature, pH, and so forth, the water. We did a smaller HABs grab in 2018, um, limited to the US waters. And 2018 was, a, as you saw earlier, was a much smaller bloom. So we did this HABs grab in a small bloom and a um, relatively larger bloom. So here are the, the maps we made from those high resolution sampling events. Both of these days were early August, um, August 9 and August 7 for the two years. And if we just look at, uh, you know, 2019, you see a large range in concentrations from uh, the highest was about 47 micrograms per liter to less than detection. In 2018, 
uh, highest was about four to five uh, micrograms per liter and lower detections further from shore. But we look at just at 2019, we can uh, learn a lot from, from this one figure. We see microsystem concentrations can vary by two orders of magnitude over short distances. Uh, for example, in this area, you know, we go from uh, around 10 to less than detection or less than 0.1, but also similarly high values in Maumee Bay decreasing rather quickly to further out into the lake. And what is challenging for models and forecast is this bloom boundary layer uh, for microsystems. Also, we want to look at um, the ratio of microsystems to chlorophyll. Um, so we see that the ratio of microsystems to chlorophyll was not consistent. Uh, <clears throat> the dark or the redder colors on this map indicate that there's more toxins per biomass. So the yellows and the oranges are there's these cells, this bloom out here is more toxic per cell than it is further out. In 2019, we see higher, more toxic microcystis, more toxic sound bacteria along the Ohio shoreline in Maumee Bay and up into Michigan. But that same pattern was not observed in 2019 where we had more toxic sound bacteria out by the islands and near the Oak Harbor region. So we can look at what factors um, kind of explain these patterns in the microcystin to chlorophyll ratio. And one of the main factors that uh, was helping us was uh, the amount of nitrogen in the water. So we saw less microcystins per chlorophyll at low nitrogen concentrations. And that's what these two plots show here, um, especially evident for 2019, which are the, the yellow, uh, the open circles. And note, we did not see similar patterns between phosphorus, the end of P ratios, or any of the physical water parameters. Um, so nitrogen had a influence on how toxic microcystis was. So, <clears throat> you know, we, we made those maps with uh, 100 samples or 172 samples collected on one day. So can we make it for other data? Uh, I'm sorry, for other dates. Uh, fortunately, there's lots of microcystin data in Lake Erie, uh, water treatment plants are collecting data at least weekly. Many groups of researchers are collecting data weekly to monthly, and we have um, several charter boat captains who collect samples for us weekly. So there's lots of data available in Lake Erie. However, when you get into that data set, there are still challenges uh, with spatial interpolations um, when there's a few samples collected on each day. For example, uh, August 1, 2016, uh, this one particular date has 16 samples collected. But as I shown earlier, that bloom boundary layer can pose challenges, you know, like what's happening between these two points here? Where's the bloom boundary layer at? You know, what's happening, you know, between here? Looking at microcystin data alone um, is really challenging and it's even harder to impossible on days when you only have two samples, right? So what's happening between these two data points is um, extremely difficult. So to uh, conclude, um, and we called that one day survey Habs Grab. I think I might've forgot that, but uh, conclusions from the Habs Grab survey, um, the high spatial resolution microsystem data set allowed us to estimate the spatial distributions of microsystem in, in the Western Basin. Uh, this is analogous to a satellite image. However, these estimates and these maps would not be possible with fewer samples. Uh, it is not feasible to, re re uh, to routinely collect 100 or more samples in a given day. Uh, so that is uh, a challenge we're working with. You know, how do we get more data and how do we um, improve modeling uh, when there's less data available. Uh, so some implications for microsystem modeling and forecasting. Again, that bloom boundary layer poses challenges for microsystems um, as concentrations can uh, rapidly change over short distances. Uh, microsystem to chlorophyll ratio is not consistent. Um, 
And if you're familiar with uh, Lake Erie, it's relatively well known that over time there's a, a change. So from summer into late fall, that ratio tends to decrease. But what we saw spatially is that there's as much differences, as much variation in the microcystin chlorophyll ratio as there is temporally. And we saw lower microcystins of chlorophyll at low nitrogen concentrations, uh, indicating a nitrogen limitation of, of toxin production. Uh, so just to finish off with some acknowledgements, uh, the NOAA ECOHAB team, uh, NOAA ECOHAB for funding and our collaborators on the, on the large project and uh, the authors of the, um, of the HABS grant paper that is, should be coming out in a couple weeks in harmful algae. So I'll, I'll be around and be happy to take questions later. Thank you. Justin, thank you very much for that. Um, so next we're gonna come into our third speaker of this second session. So Dr. Uh, Lauren kinsman Costello. she's an assistant professor um, in the Department of Biological Sciences at Kent State University. So Lauren's gonna talk to you about uh, LEARN and some H2O HIO efforts with the DNR. So Lauren, um, let's see if we can get your screen to show. All right. Thanks for that presentation. All right, hi, thanks. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for inviting me. Um, as Chris mentioned, I am representing um, a group of researchers that are members of the Lake Erie and Aquatic Research Network, or LEARN, um, that's developing a program to monitor the wetlands that are being implemented as part of the H2 Ohio initiative by the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. So the H2 Ohio initiative has identified some target uh, strategies to improve water quality throughout the state of Ohio. Um, as was mentioned earlier, this initiative is in its early phases, but implementation of these strategies is moving very fast. Um, strategies include implementing best management practices to reduce phosphorus on the landscape, creating wetlands, addressing failing septic systems, and preventing lead contamination in drinking water. Today, we're just gonna talk about the part of the H2 Ohio initiative um, that relates to implementing wetlands on the landscape and the ODNR is um, overseeing this. So the ODNR has already supported 57 wetland projects throughout the state of Ohio, um, and they're in various stages of construction. You'll notice that they have prioritized projects in the high priority Maumee Basin, but have um, implemented them throughout the state where they see opportunities for projects that will improve water quality. Um, these projects represent a really large range of strategies that are typically used in wetland restoration and wetland construction and um, even a lot of new techniques. So they include things like reconnecting diked coastal wetlands to their watersheds and to Lake Erie. Um, disrupting tile drainage in historically drained agricultural land to allow um, wetland hydrology to return to these former great black swamp farm fields. Um, and uh, in also relatively highly designed and engineered treatment train structures that are really fine tuned for water quality improvement. So this, this investment in a wide, high quantity and wide diversity of wetland projects raises the opportunity to address some really critical management questions. Um, first, of, is this an effective strategy? Um, does implementing these wetlands throughout the state of Ohio in this way contribute in a meaningful way to mitigating nutrient loads in Ohio? Um, and then also, what can we learn from all of these different projects to effectively manage wetland restoration in the future in terms of where we site restoration projects, how they're designed, and how they're managed? So the ODNR turned to learn to develop an independent monitoring program. I mentioned earlier that LEARN is, LEARN is a really large group. And so um, we have some select individuals that are all members of LEARN that we call our wetlands and water quality research team. Um, and it's kind of a science dream team of individuals from six different universities throughout the state of Ohio. Um, all of our team members aren't even pictured here and I can't introduce each and every one of us to you. Um, but 
suffice it to say, it's kind of a dream team. It includes hydrologists, soil scientists, plant ecologists, soil geophysicists, and people with a lot of long and deep expertise in aquatic ecosystem monitoring and nutrient biogeochemistry. So wetlands are often referred to as the kidneys of the landscape because of their natural ability to filter the water that's coming through them and prevent pollution, including nutrients, from entering downstream ecosystems. And by and large, wetlands serve this really important function on the landscape, but there's a couple caveats. Sometimes some wetlands can actually be a nutrient source rather than a nutrient sink. And that means that rather than stopping those nutrients from going downstream or at least lessening them, they can actually produce extra nutrients, especially phosphorus. Secondly, even when wetlands are effective at removing pollution, their ability to do that vary, to do that is, is variable based on the soil characteristics in the wetland, the structure of the wetland, and a lot of other features. Um, specific to that, the two nutrients that we're most interested in um, mitigating nitrogen and phosphorus are chemically very different. So a system that has a specific set of components that's really effective at removing nitrogen might not be as effective at removing phosphorus and vice versa. Now, the existing monitoring frameworks that we have for wetland ecosystems have been designed explicitly to assess their general health in a really comprehensive way. So these are things like the Ohio Rapid Assessment Method that's used uh, for regulatory purposes and general monitoring, as well as the Great Lakes Coastal Wetland Monitoring Program. These uh, widespread monitoring programs generally use visible structural features, things you can see, like what kind of plants are there and how many different kinds of plants are growing. Um, what are the substrate characteristics? Is it soil? Is it rocky? And just how big is the wetland? How many acres is, has been restored or constructed? Um, and then they assume that based on these structural features, these invisible, difficult to see, difficult to measure, nutrient cycling processes are occurring and this function is being performed. Um, but given what we know about the variable nature of wetland nutrient removal and the fact that sometimes wetlands can actually be a source of phosphorus rather than a sink of phosphorus, um, it's clear that when we're making a big investment at this scale in wetlands specifically for nutrient removal goals, um, these kinds of monitoring programs aren't gonna give us the kind of science-based evidence we need to answer questions about the effectiveness of these specific projects and also inform our use of wetland restoration and construction in the future. So that brings us to the main goal of the H2 Ohio Wetland Monitoring Program is to make these invisible biogeochemical processes visible. We aim to directly assess the nutrient removal function of the wetland projects that are being implemented by the ODNR for both nitrogen and phosphorus, because as others have mentioned, both of these nutrients are very important in understanding um, eutrophication. So the ways that we do that, first of all, we just wanna know, do the wetlands remove nutrients or not? And the most uh, useful way of doing that is to think about the wetland like a box or even like a bank account, right? We think about doing our best to measure all of the nutrients that go into the wetland and all of the nutrients that go out and look at the balance. Do less nutrients leave the wetland than enter the wetland? If so, then that wetland is meeting its goal. How much less? How does that compare to other kinds of of approaches in terms of nutrient reduction. In ecosystem ecology and biogeochemistry, we often call this a mass balance approach because we're balancing the mass of the nutrients going in and out. It's just like accounting. Um, this is great because this is really the policy implementation, right? We're thinking about each wetland, should we put it in? Is it effective? Is it remo removing nutrients? And how much is it removing? But it's a little limiting because there's some wetlands where it's really difficult, if not impossible, to measure all the nutrients going in and all the nutrients going out. And it also doesn't really tell us very much, if anything, about how the wetland is removing nutrients, which then doesn't give us much to go on if we want to improve a wetland's ability to remove nutrients or find wetlands that do a really good job at this. So the monitoring program is also implementing a lot of measurements and a lot of techniques to sort of open up 
this black box that sometimes wetlands can be treated as. We're going to look at how much nutrients are in the plants. Um, how much do they take up? Um, nutrient concentrations in water. Um, super important is measuring the hydrology of each of these systems, um, and that gets complicated. And then we're going to pay really special attention to the soils because that's where a lot of the nitrogen and phosphorus removal action happens. Um, so hopefully when we gather all these data, we'll be able to say something really informative about the program. Um, we've developed a general framework for the program, which we call our monitoring plan. We submitted it for critical review from a lot of technical and management reviewers, um, improved the plan substantially based on their uh, suggestions. We finalized that plan and the ODNR is currently reading through it to approve it. While we wait for that, we've already begun characterizing some of the wetland projects where construction has completed and we're starting to collect some baseline data. In September, we intend to give a public webinar about this program that will be longer and I'll be able to go in a lot more detail about this really large and exciting program. And then every year, um, uh, we intend to adaptively update the program based on changing needs and based on lessons learned. So this winter, we'll bring together all the researchers, all the ODNR personnel um, who are involved in the program and representatives from all of the many partners that are involved in each of these wetland projects, nonprofits, municipalities, um, and other organizations. So we're just at the very beginning of getting this program off the ground. Um, Chris Winslow likes to say that we're building the plane as it's leaving the runway. And I'd say that the plane has probably already left the runway and we're still building it because we want to make it as effective as we can. Um, I'm really looking forward to any questions that you all have. Thanks. Thank you, Lauren. That was great. Um, we're going to move into our uh, fourth presentation here. Um, so Scott Hale from the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Division of Wildlife. More specifically, he's the Executive Administrator for Fish Management and Research. He's online and he's going to be available to field any questions you might have. Um, but we were concerned with some possible bandwidth or internet issues. So we've got um, Scott's presentation recorded here. So Christina, I'm going to come to you and, and hopefully the video and audio work here. Yes, give us just one minute to kind of let the presentation load a little bit. So hopefully that'll um, reduce some of the video issues, but I'll get it to play in just a second. some of those and you just give me a, a heads up when I need to um, stop then. Um, so I'm going to the Q&A here. Um, all right, so some of the questions that have come in, some of these are coming in from the Q&A, but I also, they match some of the questions that came in via um, your registration. And so, uh, Rick, this one comes more to you. So what are the limitations on the current forecasting methods? So what new developments are needed? I know you work with the other modelers that are listed on your title slide. But what are some of the things that if you had more information you would benefit from? So can you give us some um, limitations on the current modeling? Uh, well, I one limitation right now is uh, kind of goes to Justin's talk is that we we can't identify how toxic the bloom will be when it starts or for a year, which is of course a big question for many people. And so we're hoping that uh, the work that's come out of that's coming out of Justin's lab and those, those studies will help us get to a point where we can um, forecast that and also forecast changes because toxicity actually does change through the year. So that that's a that's a key effort that we we want to do. Um, the um, another another one that we're we're trying to deal with is the start of the bloom, and we've had blooms start as early as. Uh, uh, last couple of weeks in June, which has happened um, when, um, last year in 2019, and then some don't get started until late July. And while there's definitely a temperature factor on that, there's that's it's a little more complicated than just it's warm right now and that's causing it. So that's another that's another component because being able to say when it's going to start um, that would help considerably. Um, and those, those are probably some of the key points. Um, some of the variability between years, there's a, a number of components um, that we're still trying to understand um, that you know, ecological uh, system, environmental systems are complicated and um, lots of things going on. And so just looking at the ones where they 
deviate some in the models, um, we're still trying to work out if we can capture that information as well. So each year we get more data. Um, it turns nature throws experiments at us, changes things in ways that allows us to collect the necessary information we have. So every year we do get better at this. Great, great. Thanks for that. One of the questions that I'm seeing today that we don't have a speaker necessarily talking on, but I can highlight real quickly is uh, what progress have been um, made with respect to securing a means to ensure safe drinking water during these toxic algal blooms? Um, and I can mention that, um, and I'll highlight a little later if time allows, that under the Ohio Department of Higher Education's Harmful Algal Bloom Research Initiative, um, we have funded a tremendous amount of projects um, to address priorities put forward by Ohio EPA and Ohio Department of Health on, on how to um, adequately treat water. Um, so if the source water has toxins, in it, how are we pulling them into our municipal drinking water plants and removing those toxins so that the water is safe to drink? And we've just learned so much about different filter types, the use of ozone um, bubbled into the treatment plant, the, the use of UV radiation, um, how to properly use powder activated or granulocarbon, um, even uh, reservoirs that are used as the source for drinking water uh, facilities, how to better dose algicides to control the onset of those blooms, but also to um, decrease toxicity. So um, I'm really, really confident in, in, in our um, municipal water treatment plants to have that they have the tools and technologies that they need to be able to um, remove those toxins when they are quantified. Um, so that's a, that's a good thing to mention. I will also come back to, although um, Rick mentioned in the forecast and it's that toxicity that's the, the tricky question, right? We can give a good estimate and, and Rick and, and his team have been able to give us a good estimation of what we might see in our bloom year, but it's that toxicity piece. I do want to point out that uh, the Department of Health does run what's called Beach Guard. Um, so you can just type it in any one of your browsers, just type in Beach Guard and basically all the beaches that are monitored in, in that space um, the uh, con concentrations of the microsystems at that specific beach are available on that website. So I strongly encourage um, folks on the on the webinar today uh, to attend to attend that. Christina, I'm going to come to you and see if you were at a place where we can play um, uh, Scott's video. Let's give it a shot. Um, let me know if you're um, having trouble with any part of it. Thank you to Ohio Sea Grant for this opportunity to close out the annual HAB announcement talks with a bit about Lake Erie fisheries. So with apologies to our friends in agriculture, I'm gonna borrow the four R's for a moment to remind everyone that no matter where you live, for great walleye fishing, Lake Erie is the right source. We're catching fish at the right rate, now is the right time, and just about anywhere in the lake is the right place. In addition, I'll take a moment to provide a brief reminder of the benefits of Ohio's Lake Erie fisheries overall. About two weeks from now, the ODNR and its partners will be hosting Governor's Fish Ohio Day, which provides an opportunity for charter boat captains to share perspectives on Lake Erie issues with legislators, the media, agency partners, and our staff. Experienced charter boat captains participating in this annual event appreciate how good our walleye fishery is now because they understand the history of the journey to get here, which included key regulations, legislative actions, and science-based interagency management that promoted, then capitalized on strong walleye year classes in 1975 and 1977 and the early 80s. Following the historic recovery of the fishery, it became the right source of great walleye fishing in Ohio and renowned throughout the US. Resurgence of the fishery in the 1980s was marked by record Ohio fishing license sales and a steady increase in the number of charter boat captains, making the 1980s a benchmark for fisheries performance. With this benchmark in mind, it's interesting to see where we are today. Averages for fishing effort, harvest, and harvest rate from that era were collectively at an all-time high. Yet in 2018 and in 2019, and continuing to this day, Fishing effort is increasing, walleye harvest is high, and harvest rates are greater today than ever. Simply put, with catch rates as good, summer in full swing, and abundant fish throughout the lake, now's a great time to enjoy walleye fishing opportunities throughout Lake Erie. Strength of today's fishery rests on a combination of above average hatches during four of the last six years that provided the potential to develop a population similar to those in the 1980s. Adhering to sound fisheries management principles, cooperative management with our interagency partners, 
and good public process will promote maintenance of healthy fish stocks and the benefits they provide. Lake Erie is a major driver of fishing participation, reflected in license sales each year. When we have good fishing and good weather on Lake Erie, we often see this reflected positively in those sales. During the past decade, license sales were relatively stable until the pandemic when a new variable was added to the equation. As 2020 began, participation was slow during early spring, then boomed as people adjusted behaviors and priorities and engaged extensively in outdoor pursuits. As a result, annual resident fishing licenses were up 11% uh, compared to 2019, and overall fishing license sales increased by 8%. Much of this increased fishing activity was reflected in very busy shore and boat access areas in Lake Erie, and obviously the walleye fishery is a big part of this. In the midst of today's walleye fishery, it's important to remember that Lake Erie offers a diversity of fishing opportunities, and not just walleye and yellow perch, but also excellent fishing for black bass, white bass, catfish, steelhead, and other species. Collectively, this diverse suite of fishing opportunities make Lake Erie an important destination for Ohio anglers. 59% of resident Ohio anglers indicate that they included Lake Erie among the waters they fish, and nearly one third of them note that Lake Erie is primarily where they fished. Our most recent surveys demonstrated that Lake Erie spent 3.6 million hours per year fishing, and as you might expect, walleye and yellow perch dominated the fish they sought and harvested. We are often asked about the economic value of Lake Erie fisheries and are currently supporting sponsored research to update this information for all Ohio sport fisheries and naturally including Lake Erie. However, I can provide some insights from surveys conducted by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in 2006 and 2011. During these years, Ohio's Lake Erie sport fishery was estimated to have an economic impact approaching $1 billion per year. And when adjusted for inflation in 2020 dollars, a reasonable estimate for today is likely nearer exceeding that amount. In Ohio, commercial fisheries operate only in Lake Erie. These sustainable fisheries are highly regulated, monitored, and managed. On average, 4 million pounds of fish are harvested each year, with yellow perch representing one-third of the harvest. The trap net fishery primarily targets yellow perch, white perch, and white bass and provides 93% of the $4.5 million dockside value of the catch each year. Lake Erie provides nearly one third of the total benefits provided by Ohio sport fisheries each year and is the greatest source of wild caught fish eaten by Ohio anglers. These benefits are directly related to fisheries health and sustained by people that appreciate them. Benefits are closely linked to the need for good water quality. That connection serves as a reminder that efforts to manage nutrient levels will continue to be vital to Lake Erie's future and that good communication and cooperation among fisheries and water quality managers, scientists, and policymakers is essential. Given elevated concerns about HABs, there are often questions about how they impact Lake Erie fisheries. Now, this audience is well aware that extensive HABs pose human health risks through contact with water, and that can certainly impact recreational and commercial fisheries directly, and also has implications for an impact on aesthetics. On other fronts, a decade of sampling appears to indicate that HAB toxins do not persist long in fish tissue, and the Ohio Department of Health has consistently recommended following their standard guidelines for fish consumption, meaning that these fish are safe to eat. Extensive HABs could potentially impact fish populations by inducing stress that could increase susceptibility to pathogens, introduce food web effects, or through other ecological mechanisms. However, right now we can't discern impacts on fish recruitment, growth, or survival, not because they don't exist, but because likely other environmental factors have much stronger influences. However, the role of hypoxic zone development in the central basin and the influence of HABs in that process is a great concern, particularly given the poor hatches and recruitment of yellow perch that we've seen in the central basin for nearly de a decade and the uncertainty about their causes. This may be a critical area for additional research as we continue to learn more. Lake Erie may be the most productive freshwater fishery in the U.S., and it provides benefits to all Ohioans, regardless of where they live. Now is certainly the time for great walleye fishing, but this is also a good time to remember the challenges that the lake's fisheries have faced in the not-so-distant past and to further appreciate the critical role of water quality and nutrient management in sustaining productive and healthy fisheries and their associated suite of benefits. 
Um, I'm just going to plug through some questions here. I'll do the best I can to kind of identify the speaker that <clears throat> this may be in your wheelhouse. Um, it's good to see that the questions we're getting live are very similar to those that were posted via registration. So we're going to work through these for the next uh, 15 minutes or so. Um, Rick, the first one is coming towards you. So if you want to try and unmute uh, your mic there, any reason the same approach um, for prediction could not be used for seasonal blooms in Saginaw Bay, Green Bay, and Lake St. Clair? Um, a similar approach could be used. Uh, we're actually working on that. Um, we're in We've just completed one analysis on Saginaw Bay. I'm in the process of looking at Green Bay to see if we can put this together. Uh, the they are Saginaw Bay has consistently much smaller blooms and um, than Lake Erie, uh, reflecting a lot less variability of the flow. Um, so that will have a factor on this. Um, Green Bay um, is an interesting system. But um, we are taking a look to see if we can put that together. Thanks, Rick. Uh, the next one I think could be for you. Also, Justin and, and Laura, you may have some input on this too. Um, how much, and, and Jim, for you also, Jim Hood, how much does sediment bound phosphorus already in the lake contribute to yearly bloom size, especially during periods of low dissolved oxygen? I think they're referring to dissolved oxygen at the, at the benthos. I'll give a short answer and someone else can probably pick up more. Um, the, the, we tend to have very, only very short periods of low oxygen in Western Lake Erie. There's usually enough wind going on. And uh, research studies have estimated maybe, I guess, five to 10%. Um, someone else could correct that of phosphorus could come from there. Um, and, we also, I would say in general, we don't see much of evidence of the lakeside because of the, the variations. Um, the, if there is a strong influence of, of phosphorus in the lake, then the blooms would not change with the loads coming in from the Maumee River. They would stay pretty much the same um, from year after year. And we don't see that. Someone else could probably add. I've got some additions for that, but anybody else want to follow up on Rick? No, I'll just say that I agree with what Rick said, and the estimate is probably closer to three to seven percent. And that three to seven percent number is coming out of work that was done under what's called the Cooperative Science and Monitoring Initiative um, that was in Lake Erie, and uh, that was work done by uh, the Lake Erie Commission was a lead on that, but also had folks from Cleveland State, um, Bowling Green State University, Justin was on that. So that was experiments where they actually measured the, the movement of phosphorus off of the benthos into the water column during these um, low oxygen periods, and, and that was the estimate. Thanks for that, Justin, three to seven percent. Um, Justin, this one might be for you. There's a question about dissolved organic matter is highly correlated with sediments in rivers. What role does the DOM play in um, binding phosphorus and maybe a source sink? Laura, that could also be for you and Jim. But we're looking at the role of dissolved organic matter. Uh, that's definitely an area of, of um, needed research. Um, there is some evidence that lakes that have more dissolved organic matter uh, can be more prone to algal blooms given um, stable nutrients. Um, so, uh, but that those are mostly small inland lakes. We don't really know uh, the the impact if there is and what it what what it is for uh, Lake Erie. But I think if there is an impact, uh, the impact of phosphorus is uh, on highly trumps the uh, DOM impact for Lake Erie. Thank you, Justin. Jim, did you have anything on top of that? I don't know if you've done some organic matter, just all organic matter work in your trips. No, that's <clears throat> that's an interesting point, and it's not something we've looked at. Our measurements don't incorporate those processes, but I think they should. <laughs> that's great. And just, yeah, just to emphasize, you know, that work that Jim's been doing is, is very much in his entry, and he's got great new funding that's coming out of the, again, the Ohio Department of Higher Education to dive into that early work more. Laura, I saw your camera came on. You want to add to the dissolved organic matter? No, shaking, no. All right. No, really. I was just going to throw it over to Jim. Um, the only thing I could add is that um, while we're working on getting a dissolved organic carbon analyzer in our lab, so hopefully we'll have at least a little bit more data on um, the potential for that um, moving forward in the future. And no, no shock that the National National Center for Water Quality Research is already um, loading up equipment to get into the next space. So that's great to hear. 
Um, Rick, this one's for you, but I, I can also take a swing at it too. But it says, do satellite images over the period show earlier season and later season blooms? So are these blooms increasing in, in time? Uh, the, we have seen the last couple of years blooms start in June, not this year, but uh, the last two years, which is earlier. I would say in general, they have been somewhat earlier. The later side, no, that, um, uh, so the early, I think, is a temperature phenomenon. The the later is very much dependent on when the fronts start coming through and produce strong winds. And if we have a relatively calm September, 2017 is a good example, we can have a bloom going well into there. Um, 2011, if you recall, it was in Cleveland in early October. Um, but like uh, last year, 2019, the fronts just started coming through and the winds so disrupt the blooms that they um, they ended early. Cyanobacteria, microcystis, really likes calmer weather. Um, this whole scum, it, it moves up and down in the water. It controls its buoyancy, so it floats and sinks. And it's really designed for a calmer weather condition. So the end of it is really going to depend on, on how the fronts work. Whether uh, climate change could affect the frequency of those winds is a good question. And I'm not aware of research in this this part of the country that answers that question. Rick, thanks for that. And, and I guess I would just reference the, the work that you and others did with the EPA to, to set the recreational impairment level for HABs. And when we actually looked at the data coming back from satellite coverage, really, you know, where it's noticeable from the satellites is early July, sometimes late June, but really gone by October, with the peak being in late August into early September. Um, and so that's kind of the, the prime time for those of you that are on. Um, Jim, a quick question for you, and then Lauren, I'll put you on next for a wetland question. But uh, Jim, the question for you is, is this just for Lower Maumee main branch, or does this apply to the tributaries? I know you showed the the, the image where uh, Nikki King was at, or uh, yeah, was at. Um, so we want to know if there's other tributaries for the main stem as well. So, so we sampled, <laughs> we took our measurements, or Whitney took our measurements, at six streams, which were... Um, smaller tributaries and then we extrapolated them up to the to the mommy using uh, Heidelberg's monitoring data so so the value the, the binding rate values that we have come from smaller tributaries but not edge of field ditches or anything like that and and I think that's one of the that's a huge source of uncertainty that here is that we don't know really what's happening to these sediments as they move downstream, <laughs> and um, and we need to, we need to figure that out. And Jim, I'll also add to that: not only when we say sediments, this is not us just saying these are ag sediments, right? These could be sediments coming from stream erosion. These could be coming from the bottoms of the streams. So when we say that sediments play a role in binding and holding some of that DRP, it's not just the sediments from ag ag sources. It, it's any sediment that's turned up in those rivers during these high flow events. Yeah, exactly. We don't know um, where the sediment came from, and we don't know what the differences are in binding rate rates among different sediments, but it's it's likely that there are some. And we saw, I, I mean, I would emphasize that in that sediment binding rate plot versus sediment concentration plot I showed, there's considerable variation there among those streams, several orders of magnitude. Um, and the, the causes of that are, are not well understood. Well, to come back to your, your referencing your, your work and some of your collaborators' work in the low flow, those streams are highly variable, right? So those yeah. sediments in one stream that is north of the Maumee versus a stream that's south of the Maumee, the source sink dynamics there of those sediments are very different. And so lot to still drill down in in that early work you're doing, but interesting nonetheless. Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. Yep. Lauren, coming to you with a question, and maybe I can help you with this because I helped write part of this, but what are the adaptive management plans for the wetlands that are generating phosphorus or, or nitrogen or those that um, are drawing them down? So, so talk about that adaptive management idea or thought. Right. So uh, our program's designed not necessarily to prescribe specific management actions, but to 
detect occurrences or sort of red flags of projects that may be acting poorly, right? Uh, releasing phosphorus instead of um, retaining it. There are some tools in the toolbox that managers may have with variable um, potential trade-offs, um, but that would be uh, something that would be more in the realm of the ODNR managers or the the firms that and the landowners that are managing the sites themselves. And it'll be interesting to couple this with some other work like TNT is doing where they're kind of using large scale models to figure out what soil types across the state would be best for this. So as learn in the DNR work on what soil types, again, one attribute of those wetlands, maybe these soil types are better at holding rather than releasing, then you can use those other tools that exist. Again, an example is TNC to then help identify where future wetlands would be built. I would also say that this LEARN effort is being dovetailed by the Ohio Department of Higher Education, HABRI, again, because that funding source is looking at new innovative ways to sample sediments and water. And so what LEARN is doing right now is the best of the best for what we know now, but we're hoping every year when we evaluate the success of these wetlands and we evaluate the success of the monitoring program, that some of the ways we sample these wetlands might depending on how the data comes out, might change through time. So not only is adaptive management thinking about how do you, how and where might you recommend constructing the wetlands, but also this measuring plan that we've developed should be tweaked in time to think how many times do you sample, when do you sample, and what instruments do you use to sample? Anything else from you, Lauren? No, I'll add that exact, uh, I'll second that exactly and just share that, you know, the monitoring program, our intention is to meet these really specific needs of the ODNR across a lot of different projects. Um, we're viewing it as sort of a foundational exercise that will establish almost some data infrastructure that more detailed research on the mechanisms behind different um, processes could be built on top of. So it's it's not designed as a, a, a scientific hypothesis testing exercise, but we hope that it lays a foundation for a lot of, and it will lay the foundation for a lot of really exciting research. Thank you for that, Lauren. Um, I'm going to come to you, Laura, real quick. You, I think you answered this already in the chat, but it might have been one on one with the person that answered the question, but I think it's a valid one. So, how does the flow weighted mean concentration from DRP that is done over the course of a year? correspond or, or relate to a sample event concentration. So you going out at one point in time and measuring it in a storm event. So could you address that for the rest of the audience if they didn't see it in the chat? Yeah, I'm happy to. Yeah, so the, the, this question is really kind of asking how, you know, these mean concentrations compare to, you know, at one point in time sort of concentrations. And there are uh, similar but different, right? So what we're trying to do with a flow weighted mean is get an average over some period of time. The problem is that we know that concentrations in the water change with flow. And so what we do is we weight that average based off of the flow volume for a specific point. Um, I have some really great links. I can share them in the chat that go over how you calculate these and how they're different between flow versus time. So when you actually go out and collect storm samples at the very peak flow, they end up usually being far higher concentrations than what we would measure averaged over a period of time because that average ends up including also the periods of time in which concentrations are low when it's not storming. Um, it is a little bit because we're accumulating that, that flow that we do have a little bit higher mean con uh, concentration when we deal with that. So the example I gave in the chat was that this year, our peak storm concentrations were somewhere around, you know, 0.12 to 0.15 milligrams of dissolved phosphorus per liter, and our flow weighted mean concentration was 0 0.082 milligrams per liter. So you can see it's a little bit different. Laura, right, thanks for that. Um, Christina, if you could give me the ability to share screen, I want to roll out one more slide before then we start fielding some maybe last questions if we have here. So let me uh, see if I can share my screen here. Everybody else did such a great job of this. I have to make sure I'm able to do it. Um, Christina, can you give me an audio and a, a visual check? Are we good? Yep, everything looks good. Good. So basically what I want to do is just do some brief research updates. So there's a lot of things going on besides the, the speakers that spoke today. So I just want to jump through some of this. 
I do want to continue to highlight the Ohio Department of Higher Education's Harmful Algal Bloom Research Initiative. So this has been going on since 2015. Um, basically, it's co-administered by Ohio Sea Grant here at Ohio State University and the University of Toledo. So much thanks to Tom Bridgman and, and his team. To date, $10 million, roughly 70 projects are relevant um, to the causes and impacts of HAP. So this is fiscal years 15 through 19. I'm happy to announce that $4 million um, has just been awarded. So we've been in contact with uh, the Ohio Department of Higher Education. There are 19 projects that we're going to be releasing via press release that will start here on, on July 1. So we're excited to, for a new batch of projects to start rolling out. Um, I can provide a list of these 70 projects that are already going on and any updates you might want on these new projects. Uh, my email address is listed there. But I just want to continue to say that this research through ODHE is, continues to be a collaborative process. The state agencies are listed on the right-hand side of the slide. Federal partners are on the left. We work closely with our NGOs and, and the farming community, but all the universities at the bottom um, have been actively engaged in, in one or more projects. I do want to highlight that these projects are driven by agency priorities. And more importantly, I would say more recently, not only agency priorities, but agency priorities that then ultimately tie back into the H2 Ohio initiative. So for this, I'm just giving you a brief glimpse. I'm going to run through these pretty quickly, but um, please contact me if you want more. But the ODNR is explicitly wanting to know how do you identify, construct, and manage wetlands for sediment and nutrients. Ag has a bunch of priorities. They want to look at effectiveness of manure management and how do we better apply manure. They want to look at the cost-benefit analysis of subsurface placement, one of our four R's. Um, how is ag going to be able to adapt to climate change? And so they're asking for projects to address this specific question. How do we do drainage retention and detention practices? So how do we hold that water on our landscape um, to reduce phosphorus runoff, but also not impact yields? And what are some of the factors that, that drive greater farmer participation in some of these BMP deployment activities, such as H2 Ohio? The Lake Erie Commission is, is making sure that they're analyzing the effectiveness of the DAP. So when we put these Annex 4, 40% in play and uh, the domestic action plan, are the things that we're doing and that we're, um, that we're investing in effective? Lake Erie Commission loves the idea of these paired and pilot watersheds, where we look at a watershed where we outfit with a lot of BMPs and stack different BMPs relative to those that are fairly untouched in this space and comparing the effectiveness in, um, not only from a nutrient drawdown, but an investment perspective. Um, and then cost curves. We need to keep looking at these H2I Ohio BMPs, these top 10 practices. Um, and so we're, we're addressing these all the time. And last but not least, the EPA and health have always been looking at source water protection, treatment, and health risks. So how do we make sure that if microsystems are, are in the water, how do we make sure that there's not exposure to um, humans and, and even our pets? Um, I did want to mention LEARN again, but Lauren knocked us out of the park. Uh, so basically the, the wetland monitoring that's going on by LEARN. Um, and ODNR, but I wanted to also talk about some of our researchers that are working on the Clean Water Act, um, so their efforts here. So Ohio Sea Grant has been facilitating an effort by the Ohio EPA. Basically, multiple universities, sister agencies are developing and evaluating Lake Erie aquatic life uses. And so what that means is basically um, the Clean Water Act requires EPA, Ohio EPA, to assess and report on the quality of Ohio's waters and publish a list of those impaired um, waters every two years. And so agencies and a bunch of your universities are, are meeting regularly right now to make sure that what we're assessing and what we're measuring in the lake is what we should be assessing and measuring. I did want to put in a, a, a comment here for Erie Hack. Many of you may be familiar with this, but the Clean Water Alliance has started up its new Erie Hack to basically address challenges like community water resources, water infrastructure, surface water quality. All of these challenges were identified through um, basically scoping sessions. Um, there's some examples in here of previous Erie hacks from 17 to 19 of products that were produced. But if you please draw your attention to the timeline, basically, you know, starting in August and September, there will be information sessions about these Erie hack events running all the way through official kickoffs and then um, the finals of these um, hack or technology solutions that are being competed right now. And then the last thing I wanted to mention for sure is that didn't want this to be lost in Laura's presentation, but please visit the URL at the top. So uh, National Quality Water Research um, Center data org. So that tool that she showed you is accessible. And I encourage all of you um, to go to that website and play around with the data that Heidelberg collects um, and maintains. I see we're right at 12 o'clock. Um, so I, I'm happy to shut down the webinar. I apologize that we do not get to all of the questions that were posed. I'm pretty confident that those that were submit, submitted via RSVP 
um, or online were addressed. So I hope we met the needs that you needed to have here. Um, but being at 1201, um, I will pause here and see if there's any final comments from our, from our panelists. Um, and then before I turn that over for final thoughts from the panelists, again, I can't thank enough all the uh, elected state and federal officials that attended this event, um, the state agencies, um, not only the leadership, but the state scientists that are on here. Um, and again, um, the governor's office and, and all of these initiatives, uh, H2 Ohio um, and the Ohio Department of Higher Education. So I'll turn to our panelists with that. Any questions or comments from our panelists? Not seeing any cameras come on or anybody speaking up or unmuting themselves. Um, so with that, uh, all attendees, we were sending out this recording. And again, it'll be embedded with all the videos that uh, had a little bit of glitches here and there, but you will have um, all of that. So with that, everybody, enjoy your Wednesday and the last day of, of June. <laughs>